This is from the website thewaythetruthandthelife.net. This video is about the present turmoil in Turkey and Turkey as a threat to the Islamic world, Arab Islamic and the Persian Islamic, and to the West. The meeting <clears throat> was held at Moscow University last year. That was 2013 in April, where a Muslim, Arab Muslim scholar uh, met with uh, officials of the university and of the Orthodox Church in a public forum to expose the common threat of Erdogan and the AKP party in Turkey. And I was aware of terrible things going on in Turkey starting back in 2007 when three young men were horrifically tortured and murdered by supporters of the AKP party, the Islamists. But Erdogan and the AKP party used this, among other things, to accuse the secular generals who were upholding the uh, Turkey consti secular constitution of Ataturk that came in after the First World War. He used these false accusations and the judges that he had control of to put the, the put the generals in jail and replace them with people that he controlled. Now it's in turmoil uh, because there was enough judicial and, and uh, law enforcement officials aware of the corruption within the AKP party that they investigated it and arrested uh, uh, the sons of three of uh, Erdogan's cabinet ministers in his party, AKP party, and the ministers resigned. They have proof of the corruption. And Erdogan used this to replace judges and police, hundreds of police officials involved in the investigation. How he has the power, but he has, he has built a wonderful economy, just like Hitler did after the First World War. He brought Germany out of uh, the difficulty, economic difficulty, and, and was popularly elected. That's what Erdogan has done. But now he's involved in this oppression. And the, the, my curiosity, what happened, the, they, they caught the murderers, the torturers and murderers on the scene where they were caught and arrested. And that's still not resolved because Erdogan and the AKP party has played games with it. In the background is another thing, Gulan, which I have a video I posted on showing that. I learned about that, him from an article published in Der Spiegel, a German paper. Uh, and here he has a multi-billion dollar network of universities, banks, and educational institutions, including uh, uh, many uh, charter schools in America that he staffs then with uh, largely Turkish teachers, and where it's uh, his his control is not uh, overt. It's it, it's their submission to uh, him. Uh, and, and a not-for-profit submission, but they, uh, the one of the teachers in a charter school was married to an American and they got divorced, and she exposed that, that uh, he was brought here from Turkey and he had to contribute 40% of his salary to uh, this Gulan and his uh, uh, religious, Muslim religious organization. And Erdogan accuses Gulan of being behind this uh, exposing the corruption. Where that'll end, I don't know. But I want to show you this uh, uh, Arab Muslim scholar and the meeting that he had called 
with the uh, uh, Orthodox authorities and, and Moscow University authorities. And uh, I will also uh, feed in with this the things about Gulan and the uh, ongoing unresolved injustice of uh, these murderers uh, of the three young men that were publishing Bibles in Turkey. So uh, I'll start off with showing you parts of the, of the meeting at Moscow University. Уважаемые коллеги, мы э, сегодня собрались э, на социологическом факультете МГУ. The introduction in Russian is extensive. I will uh, omit those parts, but I will give you reference to the YouTube uh, complete version, published version of this meeting. And I also have uh, a saved copy that you could access if it gets removed from YouTube. I would caution you, it's against the Quran for a Muslim to deceive a Muslim. In Russia, they're killing a peace-preaching uh, imams. And not just there, but uh, it's it's okay to deceive the unbeliever if it is in, uh, helpful to the goals of Allah, which is world domination. And um, the uh, process of of seeking world domination allows the deception. Now, understand, Muhammad was a camel camel driver before he started having these visions in there. And he learned much from the Jews and Christians who would, uh, uh, traders that would use the caravans. He uh, was a, a caravan driver for a wealthy man in Mecca. Ended up when that man died, he married his wife and had a pretty good marriage. That uh, one of his, her uncles was a Christian bishop that he learned about Judaism and Christianity in this process, not from a literary, but from a verbal process. There's reason to believe that he was not literate. It, he memorized, but uh, uh, which is common in many old uh, traditions. The, the things were taught word of mouth from generation to generation. It's not ignorance. It's a different culture than what we have today. But the references to Jesus, please don't misunderstand. Jesus was not, according to Islam, Jesus was not crucified. He was not the cross. He was a prophet subordinate to Muhammad. And Muhammad learned about Jesus through a false gospel called the infancy gospel of Thomas, among other things. But uh, he quotes the infancy gospel of Thomas where Jesus made mud birds and blew on them and they flew away. That's in the Quran twice. Uh, so be careful. Don't be, don't be deceived. I'm not going to refute the uh, false or misleading statements. Uh, I will allow this presentation in Moscow to just go on, but I will later on bring to your attention uh, the false and misleading statements that uh, 
with the purpose here of getting Russia to work together with the uh, Arab Muslims uh, against Turkey. You will see not just against Turkey, but against Israel and against the West, Russia joined with uh, Muslims. <clears throat> and their, their reward will be the uh, uh, Constantinople and the uh, grand uh, church built there that was converted to a mosque. But you'll hear about these things. Его изложение своей позиции шейху Имрану Хусейну слух. So I would, I am very happy to greet you here. So uh, we are um, uh, we are joyful to, to this occasion, to this possibility. Um, so to be able to hear you personally, to see you personally, to exchange our opinion with you. And uh, so we are ready now uh, to the exposition of your global vision in English. In English. If there will be need to translate something, uh, we will uh, make it. But audience in general understands English, mm -hmm. so they could... Um, well, ask you also after your exposi exposition uh, in this language, in English. So please, dear Imran Hussein. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him most high as He ought to be praised. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, on our father Adam, and our father Abraham, on Moses, on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me first of all say that I feel that I am with friends. And that's the feeling that I've had ever since I've arrived in Moscow, that I am amongst friends. It's not like that in Washington. <laughs> um, I'm also happy to be here in Russia at this time because we are now poised from our perspective at a very momentous point in history when uh, great events are about to unfold uh, which will bring dramatic change to the world and which will bring challenges the like of which we we'll seldom ever faced and these challenges are not going to escape Russia Uh, I would like to begin by reminding you, if you need to be reminded, that there are only two people in the world, only two, who believe that Jesus, the son of Mary, came, he was the Messiah, and that he will come back. Only two. And they are Muslims and Christians. Except that not all Christians are the same. <laughs> there are those Christians who believe that Jesus will return in person. And the others who try to symbolize it in order to cause it to fade away. That process of Symbolization is taking place in one part of the West, but I prefer not to call it one part of the West, but rather the West, because I do not regard <laughs> Russia to be a part of that West.
since we are the two people who believe that Jesus, the son of Mary, Allah's blessings be upon them both, mother and son, is going to return. And that his return is the most important event now remaining to occur in history. Everything else, everything else fades away in comparison with this, including the advent of the Imam al-Mahdi. This is the mother of all events which yet remains to occur in history. It is but natural that we should draw closer together. The people of the Eastern Orthodox Christian faith who still hold on faithfully to belief in the return of Jesus as a person and the Muslim world which holds the same view. In addition to this, the religion of Islam, as it has come out of the Quran and out of the example of the Blessed Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, is a religion with zero tolerance for oppression. And we now live in a world with greater oppression than history has ever witnessed. There is military oppression, escalating military oppression. Military, military oppression which seeks to achieve full spectrum military dominance over the world, including over Russia. There's economic oppression, there's political oppression, there's monetary oppression. There's a wide range of oppression in the world. There's agricultural oppression. <laughs> There's gender oppression. And so it is but natural that the true Christian would want to stand up to resist oppression, to seek to liberate the oppressed and to struggle against the oppressor. If this is the mission of the true Christian, it is also the mission of the true Muslim. And this naturally should draw us closer together. And finally, when I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran some 12 or 13 years ago, I did it because a very famous political scientist in the Muslim world who passed away to Allah's mercy about 10, 20 years ago, Dr. Karim Siddiqui. He said to me about 27 years ago, Imran, the key, the key to the end of history is there in Jerusalem. And you have the academic qualifications to present the viewpoint from Islam. And so I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran. But Eastern Orthodox Christianity has an equal passion for Jerusalem. And these two combine together from our Islamic eschatological perspective are destined to come together in an alliance prophesied by Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessings be upon him to liberate Jerusalem. How does the Quran distinguish between those Christians out there and these over here, the Western Christians and the Eastern. 
I would like to, if I may, uh, introduce you to some verses of the Quran so that you'll have a text on which to be able to focus your thought. In a, at the beginning of the Quran, Allah says that He ordered the angels to bow down and prostrate before Adam alayhi salam and they all prostrated except one Iblis or Satan the Lord God is not deficient in the use of language no and he has constructed this sentence in this way so that if you use the wrong methodology you will come to the conclusion logically that since the order was given to the angels and he did not bow down he was an angel maybe now he's a fallen angel but if you use the right methodology of not taking any verse of the Quran in isolation stand alone to derive meaning but rather going to the totality of the book we then learn that uh, angels don't have any choice no when an order is given to an angel the angel must obey but he disobeyed <laughs> it now follows logically therefrom he could not have been an angel and then in yet another part of the Quran we're told that he was not an angel he was a jinn and so we are taught a methodology at the very beginning for the study of the text both the Quran and the Hadith and now I want to take you to the passage that is of supreme importance which is in the fifth chapter of the Quran uh, uh, the disciples had pray, asked Jesus to pray for a table laden with food to come down I think it's called the Last Supper is it? Yeah. a table laden with food to come down and uh, this is the title of that chapter Al Ma'ida the table laden with food and in the 51st verse Allah Most High gives a command and He says O oh, you who have faith in Me do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who who themselves are friends and allies of each other but Jews and Christians were never friends and allies of each other and so the Quran is anticipating a time to come when a mysterious alliance between Jews and Christians will be forged a Judeo-Christian alliance when that alliance comes into being you are prohibited from maintaining friendly ties being allies calling them your partners <laughs> prohibited by the Lord God and if you do that in defiance of the Lord God and become their friends and allies of the Judeo-Christian Alliance then you no longer belong to us the Muslim world you now belong to them and the Lord God does not provide guidance for a wicked people this is the verse but this is not the way it has normally been explained <laughs> because of the wrong methodology now let me tell you the translation that you normally get or oh, you who have faith in the Lord God do not take the Jews and Christians as your friends and allies do not take the Jews and Christians as your friends and allies they are friends and allies of each other which is false which is false 
the Jews and Christians were never friends and allies of each other. Mm? And so you have a difference now between the wrong methodology and the right methodology. That Judeo-Christian alliance is coming to being. And Russia is not a part of it. That Judeo-Christian alliance is cemented by Zionism. It is a Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance. And it is located there in Western Christianity. And so Islam in the West is that the Quran has prohibited Muslims from maintaining friendly ties and being allies of those people. And uh, our moral philosophy is that this world is a moral order, not a chaotic order. And the truth must prevail. No matter how long it takes, truth must prevail. And so eventually, those who are true Muslims, you will find them, cutting off their ties from that Judeo-Christian Zionist world. I now want to take you to another verse of the Quran. This one is also in the fifth chapter, Al-Ma'idah. And it will be somewhere around verse 83, I think. In which the Lord God says, But you most certainly find in time to come. That those who will have the greatest hostility and hatred and enmity for you would be those who say we are Jews. And of course, using the wrong methodology, you say all Jews. <laughs> That's the wrong methodology. Not all Jews, no. Not all Jews. And then the Quran goes on to say, and now I want to quote the Arabic because the Lord God didn't speak in English. <laughs> and you will most certainly find in time to come. Aqrabahum. Those who will be closest of all to you. Mawaddatan. In love. And in friendship. Lilladhina amanu. With the Muslims. Walatajidan aqrabahum mawaddatan lilladhina amanu lilladhina in... Lilladhina qalu inna nasara. There will be those who say... We are Christians. We are Christians. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ الْكِسِّسِينَ وَرُحْبَانَ That is because amongst them there are priests and, and monks who live the monastic way of life. وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ And they are people who have no arrogance in them. Who have no arrogance in them. Today, those who have PhDs in arrogance reside in Washington and in London and in Jerusalem. They don't know what is humility. Not at all. Who are those Christians then? Obviously, it could not be that one. It has to be this world of Christianity which still has in its heart that love for Jerusalem. And we still long for the return of Jesus, the son of Mary, in person. And which does not, does not oppress. Which will not oppress. Which will join forces with all others who stand up against oppression in the world and seek to liberate the oppressed. That's a world view that comes out of Islamic eschatology. I am of the view that we are now located at that moment in the historical process when that 
mastermind, that evil mastermind of the end time, the Antichrist, of which Christian, of whom Christians are well aware. I, I don't have to introduce him. In Islam, he's called Dajjal. Dajjal because he deceives. Like 1907, I think it was, or 1909, if I'm wrong, please correct me, when Britain and France embraced Russia in an alliance. Was it 1907? 1907. Embracing Russia in an alliance through the front door. <laughs> And between 1907 and 1913, forging with Russia an even greater embrace by offering to Russia Constantinople. Because that's the heart of the Eastern Orthodox Christian world, Constantinople, after Jerusalem. And so this is the jar from the front door. It must have taken a lot of time to plan the Bolshevik Revolution. It must have taken a lot of financial planning as well. <laughs> it must have taken a lot of skill in, in uh, bringing about alterations in the economy. And then came that moment when Russian troops were poised to kick Constantinople. It's just down the road. And that was what was promised to Russia. <laughs> and it was at that moment in October 1917 that they struck. For whatever other reasons, this is the one I'm concerned about, most of all. To prevent the Russian troops from taking Constantinople. So they offered you Constantinople from the front door. And then from the back door, they stabbed Russia. That's Dajjal, the master deceiver with a PhD in deception. Our eschatology, which comes out of the hadith of the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and on which I based my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, uh, tells us that Dajjal will pursue his mission through three stages. His objective is to establish his rule over the world and then to claim that he is the true Messiah when he would not be, he would be the false Messiah. In stage one he attempted to rule the world from an island this is our eschatology. And I identified that island as Britain. The Salafis, of course, have come after me. <laughs> but my identification of the island as Britain has stood firm. And this, the world of Islamic scholarship out there has not been able to refute me. And so now we have an explanation from our Islamic eschatology. We have an explanation. We want to know what's the explanation that the political scientist has for the emergence of Pax Britannica out of nowhere. Our explanation is this is the Jal's phase one. And in phase one not only did Britain become the ruling state in the world, but more importantly, Britain ruled money. That the control over money, the control over the monetary system was vital for achieving rule over the world. And so came the sterling pound. And then we saw a movement of change or transformation from Britain to the United States. It didn't happen overnight. And Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica. Why did this happen? What is the explanation? We listen, we're waiting for an explanation from the political scientist. But our eschatology tells us that this is Dajjal in phase two. 
And in the same way that in phase one he had to have a monetary policy, so too in phase two the dollar replaced the sterling pound. And Bretton Woods was used to demolish Britain as an empire. Hmm? And our eschatology tells us that Pax Americana cannot last forever. No. In fact, Pax Americana must last for a much shorter period of time than Pax Britannica before it gives way to a third and a last phase or stage of the Jaws mission. I have identified it as a movement from Pax Americana to an attempt by Israel to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world. We are conscious of the fact that Israel already has every single American politician in his pocket. You cannot succeed as a politician in the United States if you stand up and utter one word against Israel. You'll be finished, demolished. And if the United States is today the ruling state in the world, and Israel is already ruling the world from behind the curtain or the hijab, but in stage three, Israel has to come out from behind the curtain and emerge as a successor to the United States of America. And therefore, the U.S. dollar will have to be demolished. That demolition job is not happening by accident. The U.S. dollar is being consciously and deliberately demolished in order for the petrodollar monetary system to be replaced by a new monetary system controlled by the banking system in the world which is also under Israel's control. And so from these two perspectives Israel is already well on its way. But Israel will have to wage great wars because Britain did and the United States did. And that's where we are now. That's where we are now. If Turkey were to invade Syria, as I have expected it to do for some time now, I'm surprised it has not happened as yet, then the countdown will begin. When that countdown begins, when the war starts, then I want to say that Russia's moment in history would have arrived. Russia's moment in history, like no other moment before it, would have arrived. This is Russia's historic mo moment in history. When, the, when these great wars start. Because Russia has a role in the end time. The Prophet and the Quran did not use the term Russia. There is a chapter of the Quran, or the better word would be Surah, entitled Rum, pronounced R double O M, Rum. And the Quran speaks positively about Rum. It says that Rum has been defeated by the Persian Empire, but within a brief period of time, and the Prophet said between three and nine, Rum will be victorious. And the Salafis can do what they can, and they won't succeed in identifying Rum with Washington and with NATO, <laughs> because that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> At the time when the Quran was revealed, there was no East, Western Christianity yet developed. No. At the time when the Quran was revealed, they were still together as one Christian world in Constantinople, with some divisions between them. 
But the big break did not take place as yet. So at the time when the Quran was revealed, Rome was Byzantium without a shadow of a doubt. And if one part of the Christian world chose to break away and to dance to every tune that Dajjal played, and the Quran prohibits us from maintaining friendly ties with them, and the Prophet said that in the end time you'll make an alliance with Rome. The Prophet said that in the end time you will make an alliance with Rome. The implication is that Rome is the Eastern Orthodox Christian world. But someone put a fly in the ointment. I don't think it was by accident. I think it was by design to distort our capacity to read history properly. And that was the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. The prophet prophesied. He said that you will conquer Constantinople. But he never said that you'll have to fight Christians to do it. He didn't say so. <laughs> He never said that you will have to fight Christians to conquer Constantinople. <laughs> he said that he will conquer Constantinople. And he praised the commander and he praised the army. But the conquest of Constantinople, when we study the timeline in Islamic eschatology, belongs to the end time, not 500 and 50 years ago. And yet the Ottomans were successful for the last 500 years in brainwashing the entire world of Islam, illa masha'Allah, into believing that the prophesied conquest of Constantinople, prophesied by the Prophet, occurred in 1453, which is false, which is false. Number one, because it does not fit the timeline. The conquest of Constantinople comes after what the Christians called Armageddon. Has Armageddon occurred as yet? No, <laughs> no. It comes after the Armageddon, which the Prophet called the Malhama. I've been listening to the news, I've not heard that the Armageddon has occurred as yet. And so how could the conquest of Constantinople, prophesied by the Prophet, have occurred? But there are other reasons as well for rejecting this majority opinion. How could the Prophet praise a man who conquers Constantinople and the first thing that he does when he enters the city is to take the greatest cathedral of Rome, a cathedral which has been used for worship for 1,000 years. Hag Hagia Sophia, is it Haga or Hagia? Hagia? Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. 1,000 years. And this is the greatest cathedral of Rome, of whom the Quran speaks positively. And uh, shamefully and disgracefully and manifestly sinfully, and I choose my words with great care, convert this cathedral into a masjid to the eternal shame of the world of Islam. How could the Prophet praise such a man? <laughs> no, the conquest of Constantinople is still to occur. And when the conquest is con of Constantinople is to occur, it will come to a, an alliance of Christians and Muslims, jointly. And when we enter Constantinople, if I'm still alive, the first thing that we will do, if we reach first, 
is to say to the Christians, this is your church, this is your cathedral. The second thing that we'll do is to apologize to the Christian world. For 500 years of the shameful use of this church as a masjid, in defiance of the Quran, in defiance of the Prophet, in defiance of the companions of the Prophet, using some fictitious rigmarole legal argument. And the third thing that we will do is that since the Prophet himself referred to the city as Constantinople, Lataftahanna al Constantinia, that's the Arabic, it becomes the Sunnah or the way for all Muslims to refer to that city as Constantinople. Mustafa Kamal could do what he wants. He cannot prohibit Imran Hussein. No. And so the name of the city will return to Constantinople when that conquest takes place. And we're moving now towards this historic moment. Russia's moment in history has arrived and I have come I've come to Moscow to share with you. This is our insight from Islamic eschatology. We have experts in Christian eschatology here. And I'd love to hear whether they also share the view that Russia's moment in history has arrived. I think I've spoken enough to whet your appetite. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'd like to pause now so that I can hear what you have to say. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to summarize in some words yeah. in Russia mm -hmm. uh, what you have described. And after the, we will continue. And now I would like to say a few words about convergence and prophecy in English. So, now I would like to to express, first of all, our fascination of your exposition and to say some words concerning Russian Orthodox eschatological vision of the situation. What is important that a perfect and very strange convergence of some crucial points I have spoken recently with uh, one uh, saint father, Vladimir Cvitko. Uh, he is a monk and he is um, a chief of monastery um, who uh, belongs to the tradition of the elders of the Starets, Russian Starets, and he was introduced in the orthodox eschatology, Russian eschatology. And uh, I have asked him to, um, to name the most important points of this um, eschatology. So, according to him, uh, all the starets, all the elders of Russian orthodox Church prophesied the spiritual renaissance, a rebirth of Russian Christian tradition after the time of Bolshevist or Antichrist oppression. So what now we are witnessing of a fulfill, fulfillment of the tradition that was made before Bolshevists, but they were more or less identified their rule was foreseen, and the end of this rule was predicted. What should go next? Rebirth of Orthodox Church and the rebirth of Russia. At the same, at the same, at the same time, two points were after that, three points. The wars and with the great suffering of the Russia. 
and also there are many challenges to Moscow and many damages that we will suffer. So very devastating wars waged against us in the future. After reconquest of the Constantinople, precisely that the elders of Russian Orthodox Church say, affirm, that Russia will conquer Constantinople and free Hagia Sophia and restore it as Christian cathedral. But that will be in the animosity against Western Christianity that is recognized as a kind of fallen branch of our church. Mm. So it is all, all, that all concerns only Orthodox Eastern Christian tradition. And the last thing, that was the great war against Israel uh, and the reconquest of Constantinople. So there are not Muslims mentioned expressly, but that rebirth of Christian Christendom in Russia, re reconquest of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and the war against Pax Judaica. Judaica. And in all these predictions, the uh, rule of the international jury was recognized as the sign of the end of the time uh, and as the representation of the rule of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So there is perfect conver uh, convergence mm -hmm. with yeah. what you have uh, said and uh, that is also quite opposite to what Salafi uh, Muslims affirm mm. because they are for alliance with the West and against so-called Russian oppression mm. against Muslim minority. So we have two global visions, not one Christians, the other Muslims, but two global visions, one Muslim Christian Christian that you defend and we defend and the other Muslim Muslim Christian vision that defe is defended by Westerners hmm. the Zionists and the Jews so you have promptly pointed out that uh, the idea of the Jews is not the, the all of them yeah. so uh, and that uh, gives the possibility to regard the third monotheistic phase as double. So they are part of the Jews. They will be, I think, that major part of the Jews will be on other That's right. side. But there will be a little part, maybe few of them, on our side. That's right. That's right. So it is a kind. What is important that this line, eschatological line, divides not religions between themselves, but inside of three religions there are two contradictory eschatological positions. Mm -hmm. Two, only two in Islam, represented by Sheikh Imran Hussein and by, I have spoken some days ago with President of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad personally, and he confirmed absolutely eschatological vision. The only difference, the vision of uh, Imran Hussein, Ahmadinejad, the, the role of Mahdi played in this situation, because uh, uh, Imran Hussein stresses the point of the return of the Jesus, and the Iranian stress the point of return of Mahdi. That is difference. But geopolitically speaking, that is con absolute convergence between Iranian eschatology mm -hmm. and eschatology expressed by uh, Sheikh uh, Imran Hussein. There is the same difference, the dividing line 
and Christianity, Western and Eastern. And there is the same line, more d d deeper maybe, and not so obvious, inside of Judaism. One part of Judaism that is uh, Zionist, uh, Pax Judaica, and the other that we could presume to be different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I would like to um, thank you uh, for your exposition and maybe you could develop some point concerning this uh, astonishing <laughs> uh, convergence of, of two forms of eschatological thought. I deliberately paused uh, when I suggested that perhaps Turkey would invade Syria and that would be the beginning of the great wars. I'm not a prophet. No, I make mistakes. I'm just suggesting that perhaps this might happen. So no one should uh, <laughs> say that I'm prophesying that this will happen. No, that's not part of a scholarly discussion at all. This is an option that they have. This is perhaps the best option that they have. And I see no reason why they should not be pursuing this option of a Turkish invasion of Syria. Um, a Turkish invasion of Syria would not only be for the purpose of trying to bring about regime change in Syria. Uh, they also want to deliver a very humiliating blow to Russia. If Russia loses Syria, Syria has a defense treaty with Russia. It's an ally of Russia, not like Libya. And if Russia loses her naval base on the Syrian Mediterranean coast and it is replaced with a NATO base, the loss of face for Russia would be strategically disastrous. There would be military implications as well, but I'm not a military strategist to be able to uh, dwell on that point. Um, I think the master plan, the master plan which the Ottoman pursued and which the Salafis are now pursuing after the Ottomans is to drive a wedge as deep as they can possibly drive between the world of Islam and Rome. That's why the Ottoman Empire did so many things that it did in enslaving Christian women and then they became members of the harem. Ottoman sultans never married because if they married their wives would have rights and the children would have legal rights but slaves don't have rights so they had only slaves and they were all Christian women. I think one was a Russian the wife the the, state, the concubine of Suleiman. They took Christian boys, which again is shameful for us, and converted them to Christianity, I mean to Islam. This never happened in our history. Never, never, never. The Quran expressly, expressly prohibits. There is no compulsion in religion. And then these boys, having been converted to Christianity, were brought up to become the elite Janissary fighting force which protected the Sultan himself. And so the Ottoman Sultans did not trust their own people. When Ayah Sophia was converted to a, to a masjid, I think that was a dagger that was plunged deepest of all into the heart of Rome. In consequence of which there has been abiding hatred for
for Islam in many parts of Rome. And we saw some of it in the Bosnian war in Srebrenica. We see it in Greece where that pain and that hatred is still there because of what the Ottomans did. But this was not enough. They need something more. So if they bring about regime change in Syria, sadfully I have to say, the world will have to expect a slaughter of the Christians of Syria at the hands of the Salafi. And they're not going to be slaughtering the Christians because of any enmity with the Christians of Syria. I think the Christians of Syria will be slaughtered in order to drive the deepest wedge of all between the world of Islam and Rome. Hmm? And this is why Syria is so important and we are grateful to Russia that Syria has not become another Libya. We put a question mark behind Russia, <laughs> another question mark behind chi China over what happened in Libya. And one day probably Russia will explain to us what happened, why did Russia and why did China sacrifice Libya the way they did. But Russia has stood up in Syria and because of that military stance of Russia, so far Syria has not fallen. But if Turkey attacks Syria then the game changes. Because Iran will then become part of the war. Iran will not stand idly by. And Russia will then have to ac accept that its historic moment, its moment in history has arrived. Russia will not be able to fold its arms and stand idly by if Turkey attacks Syria. Perhaps Christian eschatology may want to speak and recognize a Turkish attack on Syria to be the opening round for, cons for the eventual conquest of Constantinople. And so I expect the great wars are going to now commence one after the other. But we are fighting an enemy who has a messianic obsession. It is an irrational obsession. An enemy who is hell-bent without regard for consequences in achieving his goal. It doesn't matter how many must die. It doesn't matter even if most of mankind must perish. It doesn't matter if thousands of nuclear weapons are going to be used in a great war. It does not matter to that enemy. They are hell-bent on achieving their objective of establishing Israel as a ruling state in the world. And so for Russia to believe that you can sit back and the, the fight is between the Muslims <laughs> and Israel, you'll be living in dreamland because they want Russia to also bend her knee and bow before them. And they want China to bend her knee and bow before them. And that's why Russia is ringed with nuclear missiles all around you. But I don't think the Russians are fools. I think the Russians know very well what the game plan is. When these wars start and Russia becomes part of the wars, we're then heading towards what the Christians call Armageddon and the Muslims call the Malhamah. And our Prophet has spoken about those great wars and that great is all wars. As being so, such a great war, he says, that birds will fall from the sky. Indicating perhaps 
radiation in the sky, preventing, for example, electronic gadgetry from working, preventing, therefore, electronic warfare, <laughs> preventing uh, cruise missiles and fighter aircraft and so on operating. So great will that war be. At the end of that war, or towards the end of that war, comes the conquest of Constantinople. And I've asked myself many times, well, why would a Muslim army march to Constantinople? For the Christians, yes, I can understand. Hagia Sophia. And this was your city. Well, why would the Muslims want to march to Constantinople? Is it simply because we want to wage a war in alliance with the Christians to conquer Constantinople? It doesn't make sense to me. A Muslim army should be marching towards Jerusalem, not to Constantinople. And I've come to the conclusion, and when I give an opinion, of course, I always say, I don't want you to accept it. <laughs> no unless you are convinced that it is correct. But please don't deny me the freedom to offer an opinion. That the conquest of Constantinople is strategically important because of the Bosphorus. And the Bosphorus is strat strategically important because in the winter time Russia does not have a naval outlet from the, except for the Black Sea. And this is why for centuries now they have done every single thing they could possibly do to deny Russia control over the Bosphorus. They used the Ottomans. They used the Ottomans for 450 years and then after that they got NATO to replace the Ottomans. And so when that conquest of Constantinople takes place, the military significance for me is that Russia will now be able to pass through the Bosphorus. And since at that time perhaps aerial warfare will no longer be possible. It is the land and the sea. The land will also be devastated with nuclear warfare. So naval warfare becomes very important. And the Russian fleet, or what is left of the Russian fleet, and the Eastern European fleet, passing through the Bosphorus, pose a threat, a significant threat to Israel. And this is why I say that Russia's moment in history has arrived. Because great wars are now at hand. And Russia's role in these great wars will be different from the First World War and the Second World War. So um, I, I would make a little summary. Поразительная вещь относительно такого. Again, I'm deleting the Russian explanation of what was said in English. Дискуссия приобретает научный характер. Я бы хотел попросить Владимира Викторовича, может быть, высказаться, если можно английско. Я хотел сначала, а потом я, так сказать, потом я обязательно расскажу для уважаемого нашего гостя, скажу по-английски, я просто хотел расшифровать некоторые вещи, которые вы просто не успели или не смогли, и которые на самом деле для нас очень важны. Речь идет о э, том, о чем уважаемый Шейх говорит, так сказать, потом я обязательно расскажу для уважаемого нашего гостя, скажу по-английски, я просто хотел расшифровать некоторые вещи, которые вы просто не успели или не смогли, и которые на самом деле для нас очень важны. Речь идет о э, том, и, э, будем говорить откровенно, и которое, так сказать, сейчас мы наблюдаем даже на улицах наших городов. Это вот, то, что это следствие вот, вот этого, вот этого. И, э, замечательно, я просто очень рад. I'm happy to hear these great words from uh, the uh, Muslims' uh, mouth, uh, I, I'd like to say. It's really, and we must, uh, we must uh, talk about it, we must write about it, we must 
uh, uh, tell to our Russian, to our Russian people that um, this uh, this um, evil which is connected in our conscience uh, with the Muslims is a great sin uh, from the point of view of the Islam as it is. And uh, this is a way to our future elements. Ну вот, пожалуй, так сказать, я просто немножко пересказал, так сказать, для того, чтобы было ясно вот здесь сидящим, и высказал вот, вот эту вот так сказать, позицию, that it's, it's very important, it's very important at the same, at the same time with your words about two uh, Islamic views and uh, two Christian views. And uh, maybe two Judaic views, but this is uh, prob this is uh, another problem for uh, for our discussion that is more complicated pro mm. problem. And, uh, uh, but what you said about two Christianities and two Islams is very important, but uh, the, uh, this is some, uh, this is some, the, we have, uh, and we have um, some uh, in, uh, between orthodoxes, uh, Russian orthodoxes, we have different points of views, of view on Constantinople. There is a point of view, the, the old believer point of view is that uh, Constantinople is not so important for Russia because it is uh, this history is past, and uh, the problem of Constantinople was the central prob one of the central problems of the uh, Russian Raskolov schisma of the 17th century. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of the uh, mainstream of Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, not the contemporary mainstream ecumenic and Judeo-Christian, but the conservative mainstream of uh, Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, it's, uh, from some points of view, another uh, view to Constantinople, that Constantinople is a, uh, a great dream of Russian people and Russian czars and uh, uh, Russian Church, and that is the restoration of the Second World. We must also think of this, but may, but maybe historic events uh, are. We have already the answer to our internal discussions between the Orthodox. Maybe uh, the um, our destiny uh, wakes up, and uh, maybe. We'll, maybe we'll go to Constantinople and uh, uh, and not uh, and ignore our internal discussion on this. Yeah. Maybe you are right. Mm. That's all. Are there the questions or suggestions? Yes. Uh, uh, dear Sheikh Hussein, uh, thank you very much for this interesting lecture, especially about this set of uh, geopolitical, religious, and uh, political overviews. Uh, I have uh, very practical questions about uh, uh, current uh, tensions between the Shia community and Sunni uh, community in the uh, uh, Middle East, especially. Uh, what agencies uh, uh, behind this kind of tensions? Uh, concretely, and uh, maybe some uh, metaphysical aspects of the stations. There is a part of the question I cannot answer. <laughs> um, it would not be um, it's not a subject for public discussion. There's another part of the subject that I can answer. 
and that is that I think there's a master plan from a long, long time. The master plan has been that in Akhiru Zaman, in the last age, to foment Shia Sunni civil war. And that is what being pursued now. If Shia Sunni civil war takes place, number one, it'll make the world of Islam look like fools before the rest of mankind. Number two, it will dissipate the power and the morale of both the Shia and the Sunni. Weaken both sides. Number three, we might even lose some of our friends <laughs> who are willing to stand with us. Hmm? Um, the forces which are fermenting Shia Sunni warfare at this time are coming from that camp, the Western camp. And they're using their surrogates, the American Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the American state of Qatar, <laughs> which should more properly be designated the Zionist state of Saudi Arabia. Many Saudis are very, very hurt about their government and their rulers. Many Saudis have become my students who are writing to me, many Saudis, who are asking for my books. And they despise their rulers. So we should not lump the whole of Saudi Arabia in one basket. The rulers are one thing and the other people are another. Uh, the Qatar, the Amir of Qatar or the King of Qatar was uh, unceremoniously dumped uh, last week <laughs> um, by those who actually rule over Qatar. Hmm? Um, and uh, his cousin, his own cousin, is my student. <laughs> she despises her cousin. And there are others in Qatar as well who despise the government. Hmm? So they, they use, they put in place governments who will be their clients and who will rule over the world of Islam on their behalf. But if they can make uh, overtures to the world of Islam and try to build links with the world of Islam, which are, such, which are so immoral and devious, and to their benefit. There's no reason why Russia should not also reach out to the world of Islam in a manner which has greater integrity, mora mor morality in it, and which should seek to reach the hearts of the people. Russia has an opportunity now, right now, to do more than extend military help to the regime in Syria. That's not enough, I think it's not enough. Bashar Assad might last for some time. But his time in history has come. <laughs> I don't think he can survive because a new age has come. A new time has come with the Arab Spring. It happened a hundred years ago with that first Arab Spring. And it's happening now again with this Arab Spring. But this one is aided and abetted by something called Twitter. I never met Twitter, but I understand he's somewhere called Twitter. <laughs> and uh, SMS, uh, and television, and uh, the internet, and so on. And so transmission of information is so rapid and universal. Um, the minds of the people are changing now. And the new age is coming to the Arab world. I would love to speak for a moment on Egypt if we have a chance later on. We need more than military assistance for, to save Syria from becoming another Libya. 
to save Syria from a Shia Sunni civil war. And that is a, a political initiative. And Russia is well placed to offer such a political initiative. initiative. Uh, when our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, left Mecca and migrated to Medina, he met a diverse society in Medina. There were many Jewish tribes, some of them who had been at war with each other. There were many Arab tribes, some of them at war with each other for generations. And then you had two communities of Muslims, one local and one had come from Mecca. What he did was to very wisely and patiently forge a consensus amongst all the units of a state that is to come into being, which would be a plural model of a state. There were no elections, thank God. And I hope I never have to ever vote in an election and disgrace myself and all those who came before me because God did not create me as an individual to make an individual choice for the state. God created me as nations and tribes, not as individuals. He says so in the Quran. وَجَعَلْنَكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا nations and tribes and so it was nations and tribes who became units of the state and they spoke on the basis of mutual consultation within the tribe and no amount of money from Washington and no amount of broadcast from Al Jazeera could corrupt the tribe because they are tribal ethics and the tribe has to pay deference to those who are the wisest in the tribe, those who are the custodians of the wisdom of the tribe, they spoke with greater authority than one man, one woman, one vote, that nonsense that came from there. Mm -hmm. And so he, he, he forged a plural model of a state which recognized the political equality of all the units of the state. <laughs> and so there came into being a constitution. The constitution was necessary because of the political diversity of the state. Had there been no diversity, had there been homogeneity, and you already had your own law, there was no need for a constitution. A constitution was necessary because of the diversity of the state. And the function of the constitution was to bring the people together and this is what Ikhwan al Muslim moon couldn't get into their stupid head. And I choose my words with care, this stupid head. They brought a constitution to Egypt which divided Egypt as Egypt had never been divided before. And if today they're reaping, they're reaping what they foolishly sowed themselves. I don't think they'll ever see the sunshine again in Egypt. They had their chance and they lost it. Mm -hmm. The same thing can be done in Syria. And that is that you invite to Russia. It doesn't have to be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> it could be a non-governmental non body. You invite to Russia all those units of Russia, all those groups in Russia, uh, sorry, in Syria, who are in opposition to oppression, in opposition to Zionism, in opposition to NATO, in opposition to what happened to Libya. And uh, the purpose of coming together is to forge an agreement which would be mutually acceptable, which would recognize the rights of all parties and establish the political equality of all parties. 
And so the Shia would be there and the Sunni would be there. And the Christians would be there and the Druze would be there and the uh, Kurds would be there. And when you, you forge that agreement of all, agreeing to live together in harmony on a basis, of course, a power-sharing agreement, then perhaps the Russian government can intervene and try to get a Bashar Assad who I'm sure will be happy. I'm sure he'll be happy to embrace, embrace such a solution because all that he has at this time is a military option. That's all. And so you can save Syria from a pending Shia Sunni civil war. Yeah. This is the role waiting for Russia. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, from your opinion, uh, Dajjal is a personal figure, it's historical, or, uh, or some spiritual reality? Let the Prophet answer. <laughs> the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, described him as Al-Masihu Dajjal, indicating that he is someone who would attempt to impersonate the Messiah. The Messiah is flesh and blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. The, and the Messiah, and the Messiah is a human being. Yes. yes. Messiah had food. So the Jal, if he does not appear as a human being, no one will accept him mm -hmm. as the Messiah. Yeah. Yes. And uh, what about such figure? What about such figures? What, uh, uh, as what do you mean? Uh, the connection between Mahdi, uh, the figure which the Orthodox spirits, elders, tradition call the last Tsar or last Emperor, and uh, a very uh, obvious figure uh, in European and especially Catholic, Roman Catholic eschatology, as um, which is called the Great Monarch. Mm -hmm. um, very obvious figure because a, a very ambiguous figure mm -hmm. of the Great Monarch. And what's the connection between these three eschatological figures? The Islamic Mahdi, the Russian Last Tsar, and the European, especially French, uh, Great Monarch. Mm -hmm. I have adopted a policy of restricting myself to attempting to explain only Islamic eschatology and I have never encroached upon mm -hmm. <laughs> even when I know what the Christians say I have not spoken on it because I prefer that the Christian should himself explain his eschatology mm -hmm. and when we come together I hope that we can forge uh, uh, a Judeo-Christian-Muslim dialogue, eschatological dialogue, then all three would be able to present their eschatologies and we'll be able to then see the, the um, similarities between each other. But I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to step back into uh, history for a moment that uh, we do have in the Quran the figure of John the Baptist and he is linked to Jesus. It is when we go to your sources then we learn that when Jesus returned to Jerusalem as an adult he went in front of John and when John saw him, John said, yeah, he is, this is the man you've been waiting for, this is the Messiah. The divine wisdom is at work in establishing positive identification through this method. 
It follows therefore that when the Messiah is to return, there should also be a repeat for positive identification. Our eschatology says that the Messiah is going to return in Damascus. Number one, the head of John the Baptist is buried in a masjid in Damascus, according to our sources, the Masjid al-Umawi in Damascus. But number two, he returns to Damascus because the Imam is there in Damascus. And when he comes down from the sky with his hands resting on the wings of two angels. No, I should not say the sky. <laughs> the Quran speaks about seven parallel universes or Samawat beside the material universe. These seven parallel universes are not spatially located one after the other. <laughs> they are alongside each other, parallel. So you can step out of one and step into the other instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it is in the Samawat or the parallel universes that he is located these last 2,000 years. No, heaven is something else. And it is from the Samawa to the seven parallel universes that he comes down into our world of space and time with his hands resting on the wings of two angels. When he comes down, the Mahdi would see him and say, here he is. This is the son of Mary. And history repeats itself. Positive identification. Hmm? The Jewish scriptures speak about a second person beside Jesus who is going to rule with Jesus. Um, and I am going to be waiting with uh, great anticipation to learn about the Christian eschatology from this part of the Christian world, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I have other questions or suggestions. Mm. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Second question, is there any issues in Islam in the world that there will be a basis for the non-Muntazilites? Thank you. Are there in the Islamic world uh, tendencies like neo uh, Muntazilism? Muntazilites. Muntazilites, yeah. Um, this belongs to a branch of knowledge called Ilmul Kalam. Uh, perhaps can be translated as theology. Theology. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, the uh, effort to bring about a rational interpretation or explanation or exposition of the faith. Uh, is the Quran created or is it uncreated? <laughs> is the relationship between God and creation are they separate from each other <laughs> or are they identical with each other? Uh, I have not been persuaded that these are subjects that I should direct my attention to. Although I did study philosophy and I did study um, uh, uh, Ilmul Karam. Uh, and so I am sorry I don't have an answer <laughs> for this question because I'm, I'm just not persuaded that it has any abiding importance at this time. What we do have at this time is a Salafi movement, which is the mirror of European Protestantism. <laughs> it, 
it is it is Protestant Islam. It lives by the book. It lives by the text. And it interprets the text literally. The only time that it will accept or admit of a symbolic interpretation of a text is when God or his prophet have, ex have so interpreted it. I give you two examples. A prophet said that the Dajjal will ride on a donkey. And the donkey would travel as fast as the clouds. And the donkey would have his ears stretched out wide. He did not explain anything more. I came to the conclusion that that donkey is the modern aircraft. But the Salafi insist on waiting for the flying donkey. Number two, the prophet said that the river Euphrates would uncover a mountain of gold. And then the prophecy goes on, but we will not men mention the rest of the prophecy. Because of my studies in international monetary economics, I, I came to the conclusion, and this is an opinion, and no one should accept my opinion, unless you are convinced that it's correct, but don't deny me the freedom to offer an opinion. That that mountain of gold did come out of the river in 19... 73, 74. The Bretton Woods Accord had given us a fig leaf of integrity for the US dollar. It was a fig leaf <laughs> because it said that only the US dollar would be redeemable in gold at the rate of $35 an ounce. Everybody knows that. But only governments or central banks could redeem their dollars. <laughs> and so we did not exist, the people who have to use the money. The rest of the world of paper money had no fig leaf. <laughs> They had integrity only to the extent that they had a link with His Majesty the U.S. dollar. The French did not like this at all. And General Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, and may God bless him for his integrity and his courage, stood up in the French National Assembly in the mid-1960s and denounced the monetary system as unjust. The only one to do so. And then the Zionists came after him and he was finished. But what France was doing was testing the system by demanding dollars, demanding gold for dollars from time to time until Richard Nixon came to the conclusion that now the game is up. And so when the French came again in 1971, August, to redeem gold for dollars, Richard Nixon said, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep it. We gave our word, meaning we entered into a contractual obligation under international law but we don't have to fulfill our obligations. <laughs> International relations is based on Pacta Sun Sedvanda. The treaty obligations must be honored. Mm -hmm. And that's the first verse of Surat al-Ma'ida. And so he took Bretton Woods and he tore it up. And between 1971 and 1973, the US dollar was in no man's land. But France lacked a de Gaulle to exploit the moment. 
for shaking up the monetary system. And they got away. No, no voice was heard in the world of Islam between 71 and 73. Nobody challenged it. Nobody. And so they got away. And they had time to plan the 1973 war between Israel and the Arabs and they were on both sides of the war to ensure that it will come to an honorable draw. <laughs> they knew that Faisal was going to impose a boy oil boycott. He had been warning and warning and warning. They knew it was going to come. And they prepared for it. And so as soon as the war began, the oil boycott emerged. And the result of the oil boycott was that the US dollar lost 400% of its value. It fell by 400%. And the price of oil rose from $3 a barrel to 12 And the Arabs were being flooded with wealth like never before. It was at that time that Kissinger made his move in 1970, early 74. And Kissinger went to Faisal and said, let's make a deal. And on Judgment Day, I want to look at the video. <laughs> you become fabulously wealthy. This is peanuts that you're getting now. And he was true. He was truthful. He was correct. The price of oil is going to rise and rise and rise and rise and rise and you're going to be flooded with wealth as never before. This is only one thing you have to do. And to our great sadness and pain and shame, Faisal agreed to it because it was haram. It was, it was uh, religiously prohibited. He agreed to restrict the sale of oil for payments in only US dollars. And then all the other Arab oil producing countries fell in line and then OPEC fell in line. And since oil was the greatest commodity traded in the world market, demand for the US dollar will remain permanent, stable. And His Majesty the US dollar will continue to fly high. When Faisal agreed to sell oil for only US dollars, the implication was that oil now became, an ocean of oil now became symbolically a mountain of gold. I will translate. Um, вот самая главная беда как салафитов, так и суфьев, это в отсутствии рефлексивного отношения к ним. Если So, uh, our friend expressed the idea that, uh, according to him, uh, there is a great difference between Mutazilit uh, interpretation of Koran and Islamic tradition and the tradition of Salafi because uh, in one uh, uh, case we are dealing with um, rational interpretation of Quran and the other of literal in the case of Salafi. So uh, according to him, it's not the question but his uh, opinion, that a rational attitude toward uh, Islamic theology is rather positive and uh, a necessary approach that uh, modern Islam world needs. So it's I have made no comment at all concerning the Mu'tazila. Mm -hmm. I have said I prefer not to go down that road. Да, просто шейх подчеркивает, что он никаких почитал бы о Мутазилите, не высказывает никаких комментариев, просто он придерживается другой I have, I, have, I, have a, I have a different approach to the subject. I link it with Dajjal and therefore with epistemology. And therefore I approach, sorry, eschatology. I approach the subject of the Sufi Salafi differences of interpretation through epistemology rather than philosophy. Epistemology. They have an epistemology that it is a written word 
and uh, the, the God and his prophet are the only ones authorized to interpret the written word and they accept everything literal. And my epistemology is that Dajjal sees with one eye, he's blind in the other eye, indicating internal blindness. And therefore, if you are to penetrate the signs of the last age, it is with dual knowledge. An epistemology which embraces both external knowledge and internal knowledge and harmonious, harmoniously integrates them together. And this is done, this is possible only with noor, light, and it's not sold in the stock market. Да, можно сказать так, что про... In addition, uh, the question is what can Russia do? Now that Russia's moment in history has arrived, as no other moment ever before in Russian history, Russia has a dramatic role to play in the end time. What then should Russia do? I have mentioned the initiative for Syria already. I don't have to repeat it. The focus of attention at this time should be on forging the Muslim-Christian alliance, the alliance between Muslims and Rome. There are little things we can do. Like, for example, when this is broadcast and placed on the internet and uh, the world out there can see that Christians and Muslims are sitting together engaged in an intelligent discourse with no hatred and animosity, no insults flying around the table. Hmm? Uh, this has to be repeated, particularly with the representatives of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, hmm? uh, dressed in their religious garbs. And this has a powerful effect when they view it uh, in, on the internet. Um, it is necessary first to come together in inter-religious eschatological dialogue. The best scholars of the Eastern Christian Orthodox world and eschatology cannot be handled only with the text of the Bible <laughs> and the text of the Quran. You have to be able to also bring the scripture to work to understand and interpret events unfolding in the world, political, economic, in the economic, uh, uh, monetary, etc., military and so on. So when you have the best of the Christian world and the best of the Muslim world coming together in dialogue, in friendly dialogue, this will have an impact upon our two communities. Uh, there are simple things you can do at this time, for example, uh, I go back to Malaysia and the Malaysians are people who love their religion and I say to them you have a beautiful masjid in Shah Alam called the Blue Masjid magnificent structure I want you to build that in Moscow and within within one or two nights the money will be raised <laughs> from nowhere the money will be raised and then you get permission from the Russian authorities, okay? With the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church backing the project. And you build this lovely structure in Moscow to show friendship and to show love between Muslims and Christians. And then in that part of the Christian, in the Muslim world where Orthodox Christians live, you do the same thing. And Moscow raises the money and they build a beautiful cathedral in that part of the world. And uh, in this way, you're going to be doing small things that can be done right, right away, quickly, without any great effort. Uh, once the roadblocks can be removed, once the roadblocks can be removed. In order for the roadblocks to be removed, you need public education. You have to go out there in Moscow and you have to explain to them what you have understood and learned over here. Um, 
These are some of the small steps that can be taken right away in order for Russia to exploit the opportunity which has now come its way. We could start to uh, raise funds for reconstruction of Hagia Sophia mm -hmm. in Constantinople just now. No, you, all that you have to do is to pull down the minarets. The, the building is still there. The Ottomans built the minarets. Okay? So you pull, no such you, pull, you pull down the minarets pull down. and the building is still there. Hagia Sophia is still there. You know, it's there for Fifteen, cross, huh? Alex, cross, Orthodox F cross. Fifteen hundred years now. Do you have to pull down that building to rebuild it? You have to. <laughs> um, anyhow, that's a problem in which we cannot interfere. We say this is your church. <laughs> you take it back. It's your church. What you do with it after that is for you to decide, not for us. <laughs> yeah. When, uh, when Jesus, the son of Mary, Allah's blessings be upon them both, returns. Every Muslim is obliged on the basis of his religious beliefs to obey him and to follow him. I can't speak for the Christian. They will have to speak for themselves. But for Islam, we will have an absolute duty to obey him and to follow him. Upon his book. The to obey him upon his book. Um, I think it is sufficient at this time to restrict myself to saying that every Muslim will have an obligation to obey him and to follow him, to assist him. It is not for us to speak for the Christians. They will speak about their relationship with him when he returns. We can only anticipate that the Christian view will be the same. As a Muslim view, yeah. yeah. But we must be careful not to tread in territory which does not belong to us. So I have always restricted myself in my eschatology to Islamic eschatology. I wrote a book on God and Magog. There's a lot of material in Christian eschatology on God and Magog. I looked at it, but I have not used anything at all from Christian eschatology in my book. I prefer that the Christians write their book, <laughs> Gog and Magog, okay, rather than me attempting to interpret their book. And then the two books can come together and you can compare them. Yeah. It's a very wise attitude uh, to be restricted to our proper religions That's without right. making a kind of confusion between right. the theological approach. Еще есть, коллеги, замечания, вопросы? Okay. Uh, I regret that the name Sufism Tasawwuf was ever invented because I don't need it. The Messenger of Allah Allah's blessings be upon him, gave us a term, Al-Ihsan. And when he was asked what is Al-Ihsan, he said that it is to worship God as though you're seeing him. But in the Quran, when Moses said to God, Arini Anzur, he like, show me yourself. I want to see you. The God Most High replied and he said, Lan Tarani, not possible. Not with these eyes. You can't see me. <laughs> and then the Prophet was asked that on Judgment Day, 
would we, the ones who follow the religion, would we be able to see the Lord most high? Most high? And then he answered and asked rhetorically, do you have any difficulty in seeing the sun at midday? And he said, no. And then he asked, do you have any difficulty in seeing this, the moon when it is a full moon? They said, no. He said, that's how you're going to see your Lord. The Quran said, you cannot see him. The Prophet said, you will see him the way you see the sun and the moon. Are they in conflict with each other? No. When the Quran said you cannot see him, with these eyes you can't see him. When the Prophet said you will see him, not with these eyes. This is epistemology. That in addition to knowledge which is externally derived, knowledge is also internally received. And this is what the Salafis cannot accept. This is Sufism, this is it, this is Tasawwuf, to be able to see what otherwise cannot be seen. And if you walk into any Christian Orthodox cathedral in Russia today, you probably see it on the wall as well. That you had people in Russia once upon a time who could see what others could not see. <laughs> so you're not unfamiliar in Russia with the subject. This is Sufism, this is Tasawwuf, to see not only externally but internally and to have both oceans of knowledge harmoniously integrated with each, with each other. And then you apply that to the understanding of events unfolding in the world. If there were really Sufis in, in, in Turkey, if these were Sufis in Turkey who could see what otherwise could not be seen. Would Turkey still be in NATO? Would Turkey still be using this bogus, fraudulent, and utterly haram paper money? Well, this is Russian paper. <laughs> <laughs> they have it in Turkey as well. A couple of years ago it was one point something million lira to one USD. Mm. Around the world today, this bogus, fraudulent, and utterly haram paper, plastic, and electronic money passes for money. If we had eyes and we could see, we'd be waging a struggle to extricate ourselves from this. And tomorrow Russia would make gold and silver coins legal tender. Tomorrow Russia will make gold and silver coins legal tender. What about the Shia, if that's the Sufi? 34 years after an Islamic revolution, and after 34 years, Shia Iran is still using this bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money and when you go to speak with the scholars of Islam in Iran, they don't even know the ABC of the origins of paper money. They've not ever studied the subject. And yet, we're told this is authentic Islam. <laughs> so the term Sufi, I think, should be banished. And we should look again to see and judge our people based upon how accurate they are in being able to see what otherwise is not seen. Есть еще коллеги вопросы? На его великом пути. So we are happy to thank you from all our heart and wish you the successes and uh, in your heroic action and your eschatological, personal eschatological um, mission in the favor of justice, on the truth and um, the salvation of all the humankind. Thank you very much. But I'm going to also have to try to come and stay long enough to learn some Russian. Hmm.
Thank you. Earlier this month, I recorded a conversation with Kissinger and Brzezinski on the matter of Russia and Islam. That is on my website uh, for January 4th of 2014. You can see that as item 7 and the video is there. If it's been erased from YouTube, I have a saved copy of it. Putin, in my opinion, uh, considers radical Islam his biggest security threat. Uh, but he does not want the United States unilaterally to determine what, uh, how, how the situation in the region will develop. Uh, so when uh, the administration found itself in the extremely difficult and potentially embarrassing position of having refused a request for military action, of having been a, seeing a, a request for military action refused by the Congress, he saw an opportunity to uh, uh, perhaps uh, get into step with us by easing an immediate American difficulty, but solving a common problem. Uh, in my observation, his uh, biggest fear in Syria was that, that it would lead to a radicalization of the region and not so much to protect any one individual. Big, do you think that Russia can be trusted to have the same interests as the United States here? Should we, be, should we trust what is coming out of Moscow these days? We don't have the same interests but we have, in some cases, compatible interests. I think the Russians were concerned, as Henry pointed out, that the region might explode, and this will affect also Russia's position, particularly in the Caucasus, where there is an Islamic resentment against Russian domination that's gaining momentum and is becoming more violent. And secondly, he saw an opportunity to diminish America's standing as the preeminent power in the region. The fact of the matter is, our hegemony in the region is declining, but we are still the main player. Russia saw an opportunity to actually become also a significant player in this game by arranging something that perhaps will temper the dynamic towards a regional upheaval and will consolidate Russian influence with the Syrians, with the Iranians, and perhaps even with others. There was recently a rather mysterious visit to Moscow of a very high-level emissary from Saudi Arabia. Not that Saudi Arabia is turning to Moscow, but that Moscow is perhaps, again, a significant player. This is the calculus that Putin has. It so happens it is compatible, in my view, with our interests, because I see our involvement in the Syrian affair as something very unfortunate, unnecessary. I don't think an attack on Syria to strike at its chemical assets would be very productive for us. It would not solve the problem. It might ignite a wider regional explosion. So I think there is some compatibility, tactically, maybe even strategically, between us and the Russians at this stage. It's big. There is one area, though, where people say there is a big disagreement, which is Russia wants Assad to stay in power. The president has said Assad must go. The president said Assad must go without having a strategy to make him go. And we have now seen the consequences of that. I think maybe there will be some formula that will resolve that dilemma. For example, Assad's term expires next year. This issue is not going to be solved so quickly. Perhaps something can be contrived, especially if at the same time there is some movement in the American-Iranian dialogue so that aspect becomes somewhat um, contained, perhaps pacified, perhaps begins to lead to some sort of understandings. Uh, Henry, there was an op-ed by uh, Edward Lutbeck, a strategic analyst, who argued that it does not serve America's interests 
to have a kind of violent regime change of the Assad regime, because what is likely to follow is chaos and radical Islam. Uh, and nor does it uh, serve our interest for Assad to consolidate power, that in a strange way this, this stalemate uh, helps American interests. Uh, wh what do you think of that theory? I think it was a mistake to define the issue in Syria as uh, the removal of one leader. The issue in Syria is the historic conflict between Shiites and Sunnis and a Sunni revolt against a Shiite uh, minority dominated Syria in which however most of the other minorities are supporting the Alawite which is the uh, uh, Shia position. So the best position for the United States is to work on a transition government and not make it dependent with the, uh, on the removal of the Syrian leader, especially not make it dependent at the very beginning of the process. And from the beginning, Putin had said that the immediate removal of Assad would lead uh, to chaos. That's probably a correct judgment. Zbig, do you think that this is, at the end of the day, uh, a success in foreign policy terms, or uh, has the Obama administration snatched some kind of uh, victory from the jaws of defeat? I don't think it is a victory for either side, first of all. The Russians are avoiding something that they would not like to see happen in the region. We are prevented from doing something which would be equally damaging to the region, but worse probably for us namely some pointless military strike which merely dramatizes American involvement in the war and probably then an escalation of the effort. Our actions were misconceived, badly calculated, and I think this gets us off the hook. We can't use force anymore overtly unless Assad is stupid enough to use chemical weapons again, which I doubt. Henry Kissinger, Zbigniew Brzezinski, thank you as always. Let me share some background with you about Russia. I have Russian residency, and I live there six months of the year. I have a home in the Caucasus Mountains where there's constant Islamic terrorism. So I have a subjective interest and awareness. I have a Russian wife. People say, why would you go there? Because I have a four-year-old granddaughter. We went, first of all, to care for my wife's ailing parents. And I bought a compartment there in the, <clears throat> I think it was 2002 that we ended up <clears throat> buying the apartment. At any rate, let me correct this a little bit. The initial purpose had to do with the idea of family and home churches and those uh, people that gave up all, according to Luke chapter 10, to spread the good news that uh, Jesus had done away with the priesthood and uh, we could talk directly with our source of existence. As Paul said on Mars Hill, <clears throat> in God we live and move and have our being. And when Christ was crucified, the veil was torn at two, the Holy of Holies was opened up, and we can go directly to God. As it says in Revelations, you are kings and priests to God. We're kings and priests over our life. And in God we live. Just observe what's going on and learn his laws. Jesus said, it's better I go away. I will send you the comforter, the spirit of truth that will teach you all things. And how wonderful, since my grandmother was born, they didn't have electricity. They, they only had running water if they lived downhill from the spring. There were no such things as cars or airplanes or rockets. Look at how much of God's laws we've learned and how much we're progressing. We don't know much about human behavior if you take a... A uh, book on psychology and use it to raise your children, you're a fool. 
But uh, there is something, by their fruits you shall know them. There's nothing like the elders that have done a good job and to use them for their advice. That's what the old cultures used to do. And uh, there was a lot of health in that. But, uh, we're learning. Look at the examples we have of good examples that bore fruit, like Peter and his wife they established so many of these home family churches uh, you read about in uh, the seven churches. Uh, by their fruits you shall know them. At, at any rate, my initial motivation, my wife made herself a servant for her mother. Her mother was not very good at taking care of anything. And, and we had little personal life and no real place for our, the two-by-two two servants to come, so I bought an apartment. And after that, uh, the, the family matters uh, took over. But uh, that's uh, just part of the background. Three years ago, August's father died in our apartment. And two years ago, August's mother died. But uh, five years ago, August's daughter had a baby with no father. And she will not give her up for adoption that we could bring her here to a safer place. And she is a sweetheart, been breastfed most of her life, been loved dearly by both her mother and her grandmother and me. Her mother is working full time and <clears throat> the granddaughter lives with us except for weekends sometimes. Her mother works in a different city and has her own apartment in a different city. So here I am in Russia. I taught spoke in English in 97. I taught for the summer in Lithuania with the UN program and in Belarus in 99. <clears throat> That's how I ended up getting involved in, in meeting a Russian woman and marrying her. And I taught um, spoken English for 10 years in a children's library uh, there in our city. They let me use the uh, English-Russian Bible when I explained how <clears throat> good the translation was between parallel English-Russian New Testament. I had six of them at the time. Later on I went back with 24 more. So I'm there spring and fall teaching spoken English. I don't speak Russian, but the children can read the Russian. And I, my job is to help them speak properly. They learn English grammar and so forth in, in school. So, okay, that's in the background. I have personal interest and awareness in, in Russia, in Christianity, in religion. Olga's background with Malakani, which were uh, jailed and killed by the Tsar and the Orthodox Church for not worshiping the icons and, and not observing the fast days. You can look them up under Malakani. That's the milk drinkers. They would drink milk during the fast days. At any rate, the background on this, what's going on today, the hate in Islam is endemic, part of the Quran, to hate what is not supporting Allah and the, the scheme to become world domination. It is a theocratic world domination effort pyramid scheme and to hate what's not Islamic uh, especially what's against Islam. A couple of veins here. Uh, the Russians used class struggle hatred and the uh, religion was played down Christian or Muslim or Hindu any of them that was not uh, allowed to be emphasized. The children were not indoctrinated except with the socialistic hate of the cla for the class struggle. So they had the capacity to hate was there and what the Russians don't understand is the Russians are hated. 
I had uh, a good friend, I still have a good friend, uh, Ty Berchesli, who was one of the leaders of the uh, 56 Hungarian Revolution. You can find his name on the internet too. But he escaped when the Russians come back and took over in 56, and he got to England, married a woman, come to America, and he, we met at uh, night school at the University of Buffalo and became friends because that we had a Indian professor that was hard for him, being a new English speaker, hard for him to understand what he was saying. So we would get together and I would help him with the calculus that we were learning in that night school course. And he told me the Hungarian Revolution wasn't against communism. It was against Russia. It was against Russian domination. The Russian people do not understand this, the hate that there exists for Russia, because the Russian people were indoctrinated to sacrifice, to build socialism, to build roads for these people, to build hospitals for them, to build schools, and all these Afghanistan, whatever, wherever, they, the Russian people sacrificed to bring modernity to them. Uh, in the sense of roads and hospitals and schools. So the Russian people were indoctrinated with what wonderful, like they were saints sacrificing for the uh, socialism for the world. And, and it's hard for them to understand that they're hated by the Armenians, by the uh, Ukrainians, uh, not all Ukraine, but a lot of Ukraine is Russian. Just like there were a lot of Russians in Lithuania. I taught in Lithuania in 97. I taught in Belarus in 99. Spoke in English for a program sponsored by the UN that, uh, where American teachers would go over and help uh, the, the kids with the uh, uh, spoken English. They <clears throat> Again, they learn the grammar from their teachers, but their teachers can't speak it very well. Okay, so hatred is there, and it's been taken over by Islam. Uh, Stalin didn't kill the Muslims. They were welcoming Hitler. The Muslims were, were you can read about that, there was the largest Waffen-SS group was, uh, was uh, in, in Bosnia area there, and was Muslim. Uh, and the Chechens, the Caucasus Muslims, had uh, were per uh, helping Hitler. Many went and joined uh, the Nazi army. But what Stalin did was take the Chechens and move them over to Siberia so they couldn't help the Nazi army as it came in. They had a horse prepared for Hitler to ride and his celebration and everything. Uh, the... the uh, Nazis did take over the town where I live, in the, the city where I live, rows and rows of further graves of the Russian soldiers that died in that war. That was terrible, but that's a whole nother thing. But uh, at any rate, this hatred is there. Now it's Islamic. The hate for Russians but the hate for non-Muslims, it's real. That's why the Boston bombers would kill. That, why there's Russian Muslims in Syria, Russian Muslims in Kenya, Russian Muslims in Europe, or in Africa. That, and there's American Muslims there too, and there's uh, Canadian Muslims, and there's English Muslims. Islam is, is, is the highest citizenship of any Muslim according to the Quran. Now I don't mean all Muslims are uh, insanely committed to Islam and that's where their loyalties are that they but we have the psychiatrist that murdered all those uh, uh, army people in Fort Hood and we have the army guy that killed all his companions over there in one of the uh, Emirates, uh, and that it's it's real. You can listen to them say how they support the the Muslims that beheaded that poor young man on the streets of London because you're all guilty 
you're against Islam. See? But it's okay if you don't have power. It's okay to lie for the purposes of Allah's gaining world control. So that's the introduction that I that I wanted to give. There is deception, and you can read about that on my on my website or in the internet wherever. Okay, let's get on with it now. I have been making daily reports on Islamic terror around the world. I include on each page this reference to the Islamic justification for deceiving the unbeliever. You can reference this on the internet yourself or you can get the links from any of these pages on my website like the one I gave before. The link to Our Muslims Permitted to Lie is just below the introduction link. Now getting back to this Sheikh's recommendation that the Moscovites build churches in Malaysia or Indonesia and have them come and build uh, mosques in Moscow as a, a way of getting together, this next figure will shock you. It shows uh, three Christian girls on the way to school that were beheaded as part of a celebration of the Muslim holy Ramadan and what happened to their Muslim beheader. He did it for Ramadan. Then he was arrested and convicted and put in jail. The parents of the Christian girls forgave him, but they let him go home to visit his sick wife without any restraints. And, uh, and can you believe it? He escaped and is now free. Now I'll go to the neighboring Muslim country where the king agrees with the courts about uh, the churches cannot use the name Allah. And then I'll show a clip about the churches being destroyed. The Metro Tabernacle Church in Kuala Lumpur has been damaged by a firebomb. It's one of a number of churches attacked across the country as Muslims vow to prevent Christians from using the word Allah as a translation for God in their newspaper. The ground level office of the three-story church was destroyed in a blaze set off by the firebomb which police say was thrown by attackers on motorcycles just after midnight. No one was hurt, and the worship areas on the upper floors were left intact. Security was tight Friday outside the National Mosque in Malaysia's capital as police were enforcing a ban against street demonstrations. But inside the mosque compound, young followers carrying banners listened to fiery speeches. Muslims have been angry since a court decision overturned a ban on Roman Catholics using the word Allah in their Malay language newspaper. The Malaysian Court of Appeals, where three judges ruled unanimously that a Christian newspaper cannot use the word Allah to refer to God. It's a case that's been going on for years. The newspaper's editor argues that Allah is just the Malay and Arabic word for God. But many in majority Muslim Malaysia, as well as the government, think the word should be exclusive to Islam, and the court agreed. In 2009, the High Court ruled in favor of the Christian newspaper The Herald, saying it could use Allah in literature printed in the country's native language. The ruling sparked violent protests, and at least six churches were firebombed. Monday's demonstrations are peaceful, but pointed. As a Muslim, it is our religious duty to protect the word Allah. That's why we are here, to show our support. Lawyers for the paper will appeal, arguing for its rights as a minority-owned publication. The ruling comes amid rising ethnic and religious tension after May's close and polarizing election. Ram Ram Gopal, CNN, Atlanta. Now back to the torture and murder of those three Christians in 2007. In the time since, this, till 2013, Erdogan and the AKP party has used the background time holding off the prosecution of those who were caught at the scene until they could change the Turkish Constitution and get enough judges and prosecutors and enough deceit sown 
that they could take and use what was done by their supporters and blame it on the generals to remove the generals. They needed to wait until the uh, Constitution could be altered. They claim this is just good democracy. Oh, my. But they've managed to sow enough false information and control enough judges and prosecutors and fire those that wouldn't cooperate that uh, you will see what happened in the end. But first I'll show you about those three Christians. On Easter Sunday, April 8th, 2007, Nejati Aydin was in the performance of his life. The 36-year-old was playing the role of Jesus Christ in an Easter production. He loved to serve the Lord. That was his passion. Born into an Islamic family, Najati converted to Christianity in 1994. His family was so upset about his conversion. They even put a gun into his head and asked him to recant, but he did not. Sitting in the audience that Easter morning were five Muslim men who had befriended Najati. According to Turkish authorities, the men wanted to know more about Christianity. They were pretending as they were seekers. Ten days later, on April 18th, the men's true intentions would unravel in a brutal attack that would shake Turkey's tiny Christian community. Five men stormed into Najati's office on the fourth floor of this building. Armed with kitchen knives, the men tied up Najati and two other Christians, 46-year-old German citizen Tilman Geski, and 32-year-old Ur Uksel, another Turkish convert from Islam. Every time I close my eyes, it looks like I, I see, I have a good, um, I can picture things very well. So when I close my eyes, I always see him sitting in the office. Tillman and Susanna moved to Malatya in 1997. They knew that living here wasn't going to be easy. The city has deep Islamist and nationalistic roots. Anti-Christian sentiments run high here. I interrupt to note here for those who are not aware, this is the Christian, former Christian land of the seven churches in the Bible. It was invaded by the Turkic Muslims and they have murdered all the Christians that wouldn't deny Christ. A Christ, the one crucified, is not what's in the Quran. That's a different Jesus. They, uh, he made mud birds, of, as I've said before, and it's a false uh, from a false gospel. But pay attention. This this is Islam. This was a tense place. Yes, we know this. Ur Yuxel experienced the tension in 2005 when protesters stood outside the same building accusing him and other believers of using a publishing company to distribute Bibles. The Bible tells us that when we accept Jesus into our lives, we must be willing to count the cost. What happened next behind this door is still under investigation, but authorities tell us that for two hours, the men were repeatedly tortured. He had lots and lots of bruises. I must have been beaten up a lot. During the torture, the men first our husbands to recite Islamic prayers and to try to get them to renounce to the Christian faith. Police were dispatched to the scene after getting calls from a nearby office about suspicious activity. Sources are telling CBN News that uh, as soon as the suspects heard the police coming, they decided to end the lives of the three Christians. What did they do to these three men? Uh, they cut their throat. When the police burst through the door, they found the three with their hands and legs tied to chairs. Tilman and Najati were dead, their throats slit open. In this video obtained by CBN News, the police can be seen arresting some of the suspects inside the office. The alleged ringleader tried to escape by jumping from the fourth floor balcony. He is still in the hospital. Ur was on the floor, but still breathing. He was rushed to the hospital, but died several hours later. The suspects reportedly told investigators that they killed the men in defense of Islam. All five were carrying a letter that read, 
This should serve as a lesson to the enemies of our religion. We did it for our country. Do you consider your husband today a martyr for Christ? Yes, I do. I think he died on the sake of Christ. And I can tell this to my kids, and they know that her, her, their father died for Jesus. I miss him a lot, but I know that my father is up in heaven, having fun with Tilman and Orr. The attack was the third against Christians in Turkey. A Catholic priest and a prominent Armenian journalist were killed in the last 12 months. The situation for Christians has uh, gotten particularly worse in the last couple of years, especially after repeated negative stories about them in the national media. Take, for example, this particular publication. It says 10,000 have become Christians. Turkey gripped in fear. This was done by the AKP party and Erdogan. That's their propaganda. And they've used it to whip up support that they can get democratically elected and get the Constitution changed that they have the right to take over the, they call it the democracy, because by, by vote they got the right to replace judges and, and, and uh, now uh, brought the secular generals that protected human rights, brought them to trial accusing them of what they did than accusing them of murders and plots. Pay attention because it's, it's like the, the Turkish general said, they don't have to use the, uh, uh, jihad anymore in Europe. They're going to ride the democratic bus. Mustafa Akyol, a prominent Turkish journalist, believes that such false claims only fuel the anti-Christian sentiment. The media, unfortunately, has repeatedly uh, depicted missionaries as the fifth column of Western imperialism. Please note here that Erdogan is using hate for the West to whip up support. And that's exactly what that sheikh in Moscow was doing to whip up support against Turkey, that there are friends of the West. Pay attention to the way they manipulate hate and deceit. Uh, and this Western imperialism supposedly tries to carve up Turkey into pieces. And it's not just the media. Turkey's National Security Council has listed missionaries and several evangelical groups as threats to the country. They have set us up as a target for someone or whoever wants to make himself a hero. And, uh, you know, the government, the media is saying that these people are poisoning the minds of individuals and children and youth. And so anybody, any youth will get up and say, hey, you know, if I kill one of these, then I'll look good. Turkey is a secular country. Freedom of religion is guaranteed under the Constitution. But some fear the country is edging towards a religious state ruled by radical Islamists. A few days after their deaths, Susanna and Shamsa publicly forgave their husband's killers, an act that stunned the community and drew national attention. We forgive them because Jesus forgave us. And he said we should love our, our enemies. Susanna says her husband found comfort in the words of the prophet Isaiah. His last journal entry quoted Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, words that today bring comfort and hope to the family he left behind and a resolve to stay and finish the work. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearts, to proclaim freedom for the captives. They will be called Oaks of Righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor.